All right. Hello, everybody. Thank you for coming. Today, we're very lucky to have Keith Wilson. Keith Wilson did his degree at work with Bill Brewer. Um, so if you know anything about philosophy of perception, you should be very impressed now. Um, and he is now, luckily, right next door to us at the University of Glasgow as a postdoctoral fellow on the Rethinking the Senses program. So very excited to have Keith here today to talk about smell. Thanks very much. Um, and thanks for having me. Um, so I guess the question that's sort of in the background here that I'm interested in is how do we individuate the senses? So that is, what makes something one sense, like vision, rather than another, say, audition? Um, and I think smell is a really interesting test case for this, uh, for a number of reasons. First of all, it's not vision, because a lot of the literature in this area is really focused on the visual modality. And it's, it's important to get away from that and think about other, uh, other sensory modalities as well. But also because smell combines very readily with, with taste um, to, to form the experience of flavour when we, when we eat food. So there's a, a multi-sensory or cross-modal interaction between uh, taste and smell there. And I'm going to try and say a little bit about what that might, what that might mean. So the plan for the, the talk is, um, I'm going to start off with this, this claim which um, you find in the literature, uh, due to Paul Rosen, uh, that olfaction is a, a dual sense. Um, and I want to try and unpack what that really means, what does it amount to in, in philosophical terms. And there are a number of different interpretations of that. So one is that we have um, two, perhaps surprisingly, we have two um, olfactory uh, senses, two senses of smell in, in, some, in some sense, which could be that we have two different types of olfactory sense, and I'll say a, a bit more about why you might think that. Another possibility is we have two tokens, two instances of an ol olfactory sense. And a third possibility that there's a functional distinction here, that smell does two different jobs, uh, it has two different functional roles. And what I'd like to, so this is a bit of, bit of kind of tentative proposal, but what I'd like to suggest is that there's a, a distinction here from Gibson's ecological perception, which can actually help us to make sense of uh, what has become a bit of a conceptual model in this, in this area. So I should say that I'm not actually going to come to, I'm not going to tell you whether we have one or two senses of smell. What I really want to do is lay out what are the, the grounds for making that decision on what, what are the, the criteria we should apply um, to say whether we have one or two senses of smell. And of course, that's going to generalize to other senses as well. Uh, not just the familiar five senses, but also senses like our sense of balance, the vestibular sense, proprioception, maybe um, sense of hot and cold temperature, uh, and so on. So really what I want to convince you of by the end of the talk are, are two things. So one, that smell is really interesting. It's actually really complex, and there's a lot that's not understood about it. Um, and two, that the problem of individuating the senses is even harder than you might have thought. It's a really difficult problem and it's actually just not clear what we should, what we should say about this, but I hope to um, introduce some useful conceptual distinctions. So that's the, that's the plan. So if you look at the literature in this area, everybody cites this paper by Paul uh, Rosen uh, in which he makes a number of uh, quite bold claims about uh, the olfactory uh, sense. By the way, I'm going to use the term olfaction as being kind of neutral between whether, whether olfaction is a, is a sense or not. So how um, these two senses, these two olfactory senses, line up with what we normally call a sense in ordinary language. I'm going to kind of leave that open. So when I talk about olfaction, um, that might not correspond to what we ordinarily mean by a sense, but it's just supposed to be a neutral, a neutral term here. So in this paper, um, Rosen says, olfaction is a dual sense. It functions both for sensing objects in the outside world and for objects in the mouth. Now, this has widely been taken up in the literature to, to mean that we have two senses, uh, two olfactory senses. Um, one of them is, is what we traditionally think of as smell, where we, where we sniff an odour and we detect its properties that way. The other one's much more intimately linked with, with taste. So when we eat, it's uh, well known that Actually, the majority of uh, the sensation that we get from, from food, from flavour, actually comes from our sense of smell, not from our sense of taste. Taste is just the five, maybe six basic uh, tastes of sweet, salty, sour, bitter, and so on. 
Smell is where you get all the kind of subtlety and the nuance, and that combines with taste to give you an experience of flavour. So, this is widely been taken to mean that we have two senses of smell, but what does that really mean? And I think, as it stands, Rosen's claim is ambiguous between a number of different interpretations. So one interpretation is, we have two different type senses. So, so a type here is a general kind of thing. So we have a, a sense of vision, we have a sense of audition, we have a, a sense, um, the suggestion would be, we have two different olfactory senses that are different in kind. That would be that, that interpretation of the claim. Another interpretation might be that we've got two token senses. So they're the same type of sense, so they're both olfactory senses, but we have two instances of that, of that type. Um, so the distinction between type and token, hopefully you'll be familiar with that, but for example, if you take the, the title of this seminar, the PIG, if I were to ask you how many letters are in that acronym, so you might answer four, so that would be four token instances, four, four letters, but there's only three types of letter in that acronym, because the first C, I assume, is, as first P is, is silent. Right, so there's a P uh, and I and a G, but there's two, there's two P's. So there's only three types with four tokens. So it's the same idea being applied to types and token instances of sensory modalities. A third interpretation of this, of this claim is that, um, and in a way, this, this actually follows more naturally from, from the way Rosen frames it, is that olfaction has two different functional roles, which does two different things for us. One is uh, to do with smelling, which is perhaps associated with identifying a type of, the type of thing, the type of object in the world uh, that we're experiencing. The other one is associated with taste and gustation, uh, which gives us information about um, some substance we have in our mouth when we're eating things. Um, and so I'm going to kind of bracket that third one until the very end. I want to come back to it. And first of all, I want to focus on the, the type and token distinction. So why might you think there are two senses of smell? Um, so I think it's useful just to, to a little bit of background on the, the physiology of, of smell and um, that hopefully explains why people are motivated to, to make this claim. So there are two um, olfactory pathways, if you like, two different routes by which um, substances can get to the, the sensory surface associated with smell. And that sensory surface is called the olfactory epithelium. It's the top of your nasal cavity, and it detects um, chemicals, physical properties of, of chemicals, which actually um, uh, go into the nose when you, when you breathe in or when you're eating food. Um, and there are lots and lots of receptors on that surface which can detect different types of chemicals, which give rise to all the different smell sensations we can detect. So what we normally think of as our, our sense of smell um, is when we inhale air through the nose, uh, by sniffing, for example, um, the air then flows up uh, through the nasal cavity, hits the olfactory epithelium, and then is connected to uh, a variety of brain regions um, after that. So that's orthonasal uh, olfaction. Orthonasal meaning from the, from the front. So that's to do with when we inhale the, sub inhale, um, the olfactant uh, and then it hits the olfactory epithelium. Now typically when we smell things in this way, um, we perceive them as either being located out there in the world, in front of our nose, or sometimes actually in the nose, maybe if you get a kind of sense of, uh, of a, an odour that's kind of stuck in your nose, you actually think of it as being located in, in your nose. Uh, but it, it's actually either externalised or, or located in the, in the nose. So that's orthonasal olfaction. Retronasal olfaction, so retro meaning from, from the back, is when you, um, you get uh, air and olfactants actually uh, going the other way, so they're actually coming out. So in fact, when you, when you chew or swallow something, um, you get the retronasal olfaction when you exhale. And you can actually test that by, if you hold your breath or, or if you clap your nose shut while you're eating, you won't get any of the, um, any of the olfactory sensations, you need to actually be breathing to, or breathing out, exhaling to get this, this sensation. And of course we all know that if you, get, if you catch a cold and you can't breathe in and out, you lose uh, the olfactory sense. So people often say they lose their sense of taste when they get a cold. Actually it's not taste you're losing, it's just uh, 
uh, it's just olfaction. So in retroneasal olfaction, the air is actually being propelled upwards um, from the back of the throat when chewing or swallowing. It's flowing out through the nose. And again, the olfactin, just chemical substances, are hitting the olfactory epithelium and, and causing sensations uh, of, of smell. Now, interestingly, so, so far all we've got is we've got two different pathways to the same, the same thing, the same sensory surface. But interestingly, with retronasal olfaction, the olfactant is perceived as being in the mouth or in the, the throat. So it's typically localised to, to the mouth. And when you think of it, about it, that makes sense because typically when you're getting retronasal olfaction, you're eating because you're chewing or swallowing. And the, the substance is actually located inside your mouth. So there's an interesting question here about whether this is actually a kind of illusion that uh, because you're really smelling the substance and it's really the signal's really coming from your nose, whether um, this uh, what's called referral, gustatory referral, uh, perceiving it in the mouth as a kind of illusion. Uh, and Louise Richardson has a nice paper on this where she argues actually it's not an illusion because um, in the in the good case, in the, in the uh, veridical case when you're eating something, the substance is actually located in your mouth. To say it's an illusion would be like saying, in the case of vision, when I perceive the chair as being located over there, really what's happening is light is hitting my retina, that's the sensory surface for vision, um, and that all the sensations happen at the retina. So, so it's, it's just an illusion that I'm projecting the object as being located over there, but actually it's happening at, at my retina. So that's, that would be parallel to saying, you know, really you're just smelling it, and really it's in your nose, so it's an illusion that's referred to the, to the mouth. But, so I think that's kind of a bit of a red herring when people talk about that as being, being a kind of illusion. But those are the two, um, the two uh, uh, senses of, uh, of smell, orthonasal and, and retronasal. And from the olfactory epithelium um, through the olfactory bulb, uh, there are projections into the hippocampus, the periform cortex, the amygdala, lots of other brain areas associated with, uh, with taste and smell. Interestingly, smell has direct projections into the hippocampus, which is why um, it has an intimate connection with evoking memories. So you get very powerful memories evoked by particular sense of smell. So the Proust phenomenon, where he uh, tastes a, uh, a madeleine, it brings back, flooding back his memories of his, his childhood. Uh, that's because the, uh, scientists think that it's not modulated by other brain areas before. Um, going into the hippocampus, it has kind of a direct route <coughs> into the hippocampus, which is associated with memory. However, there are significant unknowns. So, no one really knows why um, retronasal olfaction is referred to the mouth and orthonasal olfaction is referred to the nose. Given that, they share a single sensory surface. They both go through the olfactory epithelium. It's not clear what the exact mechanism for that is, how the brain can differentiate between those two signals, given that they're arriving at the same sensory surface. And there are various hypotheses about how that, uh, how that happens. By the way, I'm happy to take um, clarification questions as we go along, so if, if anyone wants to ask anything, I'm happy to, to answer. So with that in mind then, I want to think about how we might individuate the senses of smell. Is that, should we think of that as one sense <laughs> performing two different functions? Should we think of it as two senses? Are they Type, different types of sense or different token sense, senses, and how, how might we make that uh, decision? So traditionally, this has been a, a problem that has uh, taxed philosophers for thousands of years, going back to Aristotle. Um, and there are lots of criteria being proposed as to what makes a particular sense the sense that it, that it is, lots of individuation criteria. In a way, what's, what's at stake here is what do we actually mean by a sensory modality? When we say um, vision is a different sense to audition, what does that really amount to? Or how, can we, uh, how can we test that? So a number of criteria which are, have been used quite widely, um, each one of which is problematic on its own. So none of these really seems to do the job of carving up the senses in the way that we think of them uh, as being divided. Uh, but people have tried to use them in various combinations, uh, and it's still a live question as to, as to what the, if you think there's a correct account, what the correct account is. So the, the four criteria um, are, are this. So first of all, thinking about the, the proximal stimuli. What kind of thing or what property in the world um, stimulates or gives rise to uh, sensory experience in a particular modality. So for vision, 
you might think that um, it uniquely is able to um, uh, allow us to perceive the property of color, for example. So color is unique to vision. We don't get color in any other uh, modality. So that's uh, that's proximal stimuli. Or you might think it's it's light. You know, light hitting the retina. That's the kind of uh, stimuli. But it's about the actual uh, the proximal cause or the, the property which causes that kind of experience. And this is what Aristotle referred to as the, the proper sensibles. His idea was for each sense modality, there's a unique uh, property or type of thing in the world um, which that sense allows us to pick up on. Um, the problem for this view is there are lots of properties like, for example, shape that we can get through multiple modalities. So we can get shape through touch or, or through vision. Um, and we might think, now when we're thinking about the kinds of properties that are in the world, there aren't really unique properties for each of the senses, especially if we think of the senses in a very fine-grained way, and lots of them do pick up on the same properties. So this, this criterion doesn't seem to do the work on its own. So a second criterion that people have appealed to is the, the sensory organ criterion. What's actually doing the, the sensing? So again, for each of our senses, you know, uh, vision is through the eyes, audition is through the ears, uh, taste is through the, the tongue, and so on. So the idea that we can divide up the senses according to which bit of the body was the sensory organ or the sensory surface um, that allows us to, uh, to sense in that modality. Now you can take that, I think this is probably the closest to the, the sort of full conception of uh, what makes for a sensory modality. If you ask people um, what unifies all the different sensations uh, that we call touch, so touch is, um, relates not just to uh, feeling pressure, but also to feeling temperature, possibly pain, texture, and so on. So certain properties like the property of wetness is thought to be uh, a combination of, of temperature and, uh, uh, and, and pressure, kind of slipperiness of, of the substance. So that's a, a kind of combination of two different things. Um, people also say, well, you get them all through the skin. That's what makes them touch, it's because it comes through the skin. The skin is the sensory organ for, for touch. But if you want to be a bit more fine-grained about it, you might want to extend that criterion to, um, to apply to what's going on in the nervous system, which brain region is activated by that particular sensory modality. So for each of these much finer-grained modalities, there are going to be certain brain regions which are activated. So we might think the sensory organ criterion, um, we could extend to thinking about the nervous system and, and the brain to give a, a finer-grained taxonomy. Um, a third criteria that a lot of people have appealed to is uh, what philosophers like to call the phenomenal character or the, the what it's like of experience, the subjective quality uh, of, of the experience. So um, vision has a characteristically, uh, uh, there's, there's something it's like to have a visual experience which is quite distinct from what it's like to have an auditory experience to hear a sound. Uh, and they're just, it's just kind of obvious to us that those are, those are different in some way. So using our uh, introspective ability, we can draw um, distinctions between the different senses on, on the grounds of their, their phenomenal character. And the people have often used this in combination with criteria, criterion one or two um, to, to try and uh, give, a, uh, give a more accurate uh, kind of taxonomy of the, of the senses. I'm going to come back to some of these uh, a bit later. Um, the fourth criterion is uh, representational content. So if you think that perceptual experience is representational, then, uh, or it's, uh, it has intentional content, it's about something, then the type of content that the experience has uh, might help us to individuate the, the sensory modality. So vision uh, perhaps represents uh, the properties of having certain colors or shapes, or perhaps it represents in a particular way as a mode of presentation that's distinctly visual, uh, which is distinct from auditory. Uh, representation. So that, that criterion, you can see there's a bit of overlap between these, these, these four different things. So some philosophers think that phenomenal character um, supervenes on or is identical to representational content. So for, for them, criterion three and four are going to go together. Similarly, representation might relate to the kind of proximal stimulus that a given sense has. So again, they might be quite closely related. So they're not supposed to be exclusive, but they're um, uh, they are alternative ways of, of carving up the, the space of sensory modalities. And similarly, they're not, they're not exhaustive. We could have other criteria. We could think about how a given sensory modality interacts with other modalities. Um, 
and that might help us determine which modalities there are. So that's just kind of a little overview of, of some of the some of the, the literature and the, and the thinking in this in this area. So what I want to do now is look at how this plays out in the case of orthonasal and retronasal olfaction, these, these um, supposed two different senses of smell. So how do how they fare on the proximal stimuli criteria? Well, it looks like both forms of olfaction are sensitive to the same kinds of properties. They're sensitive to the, the physical, chemical properties of olfactants, so uh, smelly stuff, basically. Um, there's not really any difference between, given that, remember, the detection here has been done by the olfactory epithelium, so it's the same sensory surface in both cases. Um, it's sensitive, uh, as it turns out, to, to the same kinds of properties of, of objects. So it looks like, by this criterion alone, we should think of retronasal and orthonasal olfaction as being a single sense. If that was the only criterion we wanted to use, we'd say they're the same sense because they pick up on the same proximal uh, stimuli. When we turn to the second criterion, the, the sense organ criterion, things start to get a little bit more complex. So as I've said, both orthonasal and retronasal olfaction share a single sensory surface. So if our criterion tells us um, we should only be interested in the sensory surface, or, or even that it comes in through the nose, we should say they are the same sense, they're the same type uh, of sense, because they share that sensory surface. But, as I suggested earlier, if you want to extend that criterion to include what's going on in the, in the nervous system and the brain, then we start to see some differences between the two. Um, orthonasal olfaction um, that activates areas which are traditionally associated with smell, retronasal olfaction also shows uh, a higher level of activity in areas that are associated with taste or flavour. So there are, there are differences in what's going on in the brain. So if we extend our criterion to cover that, to what's going on in the brain and the nervous system, then it looks like the criterion is going to say, actually there are two different types of senses because uh, there are two different mechanisms at play here. When we look at the, the neuroimaging data in this area, we find, although there's considerable overlap between the areas associated with, with the, the, um, the two olfactory senses, um, as I say, there are differential levels of activation uh, between orthonasal and, and retronasal olfaction, and, and Small and others have a nice paper on this. Uh, and in fact, what we find is that the gustatory areas that are associated with taste are more active in retronasal olfaction. And this has led some people, uh, so Spence and others, have proposed this, uh, something they call the flavour network in the brain. So the flavour network is what combines information from taste and information from smell to give experience of flavour. So you might think of flavour here as a, almost as if it's a, a sensory modality in its own right. We've got taste, we've got smell, we've got flavour, which somehow combines information from the two. Uh, this is a bit confusing because we normally call flavour taste, so you, you ask how something tastes, you don't, uh, we don't even have a, uh, a word to describe that, but um, some people have argued that's just a mistake, we, we miscategorise flavour as taste, and in fact we miscategorise retronasal olfaction as, as a component of, of taste. Really what, what we should be saying is that taste and retronasal olfaction are components of flavour, that, that would be a more philosophically apt way of putting it. I'm not sure that's right, actually. I, I, I might um, want to argue against that. So that's the sense organ criterion. So as you can see, that doesn't really give us a clear verdict as to whether we should, should think of this as one sense or, or two. It's going to depend on the exact version of the criterion we use. If we restrict it to the sensory surface, it's going to say one sense. If we extend it to what's going on in the brain, it's going to say two. So that's not really a clear result. Now, where things get really interesting is when we start to look at the phenomenal character criteria. So in his paper, um, Rosen makes a number of, of bold claims or, or predictions about what we should find uh, in terms of the phenomenal character of, of olfaction. So he says, the olfactory system is the only major sense modality that is frequently confused with another sense modality, namely taste. So as I was just describing, um, people routinely mischaracterise retronasal olfaction as as, um, as being a form of taste, but taste really only gives us basic, you know, salty, sweet, and so on. You can't smell that something's sweet, you can only taste that it's sweet. Um, 
uh, th those are both components of flavor. So he says, look, we just, we just mix this up. We, we mischaracterize it as a, as a form of taste, but actually it's something, something different. We don't do that with orthonasal olfaction. When you sniff something, you don't say, oh, that tastes really good. You might think it, it, if you were to eat it, it would taste good. Uh, but that's something slightly different. And you might also be wrong about that. Something that smells nice might taste horrible, and vice versa. Rosen also says, the same olfactory stimulus seems qualitatively different when referred to the mouth or the outside world. Um, and in a similar vein, it seems very likely that the olfactory component of uh, what I'm calling flavor differs markedly from the olfactory consequences of the same substance in the external world. So what he seems to be suggesting here is that there are substances which, when you um, detect them orthonasally, and when you detect them retronasally, um, from the back of the throat, uh, they have a different phenomenal character. They seem different, they smell different, if you like. Um, so that's a really interesting claim, and the suggestion that there's a, he, he does see it, it seems very likely, so he's making a, a prediction here. And this is a prediction we can test. And the experiments have actually been done. Um, and I think to some extent they bear out Rosen's hypothesis, but not in the dramatic way that he seems to suggest. The differences are a lot more limited. Now, typically when you uh, talk to psychologists or philosophers who work in this area, they'll say, well, it's just obvious that things retronasally and orthonasally are, um, smell quite different. You know, think about coffee or think about some kind of really smelly cheese, you know, it smells, the cheese smells really disgusting uh, when you sort of inhale the, uh, the odour, but when you taste it, it's really delicious and, and fragrant, um, and that's because you're getting that, that same substance retronasally rather than orthonasally. Um, so for some substance X, it tastes different to the way it smells, and this is a quite a familiar phenomenon. Unfortunately, I don't think it's really helps us settle the question for the reason that we're, we're not really comparing like with like here. Remember, the question was, is orthonasal olfaction a different sense from retronasal olfaction? So to, to make that comparison, we need to uh, compare the same substance um, detected orthonasally and retronasally. But here, what we're comparing is a case of orthonasal olfaction, which um, you might think is a unimodal or a single modality experience, with the experience of flavor. Because you've got taste involved, you're actually eating the thing. And flavor, you might think, is a multimodal experience because it's, it's, it's not just retronasal olfaction, it's retronasal olfaction combined with taste. So we're not really comparing like with like here. The presence of the taste kind of transforms the experience into something different. And you could explain it just by the, the taste component. Um, it's also, um, we find it very difficult to, isolate the olfactory component of a flavor experience. So when we, when we eat something, it's very hard to just reflectively think, well, which bit of this experience is coming from smell and which bit's coming from taste? And the fact that people routinely confuse them is, is evidence that we're just not very good at doing this introspectively in a way that we are very good at, for example, differentiating between uh, visual experience and auditory experience. They seem very different to us. They don't seem to fuse in the same way. But when you get taste and smell combining, um, it gives rise to a completely different pair set, a different, um, different kind of experience. So when you eat, eat the smelly cheese, it's hard to actually identify that nasty, you know, pungent unpleasantness which, uh, which you got through olfaction in, in the flavor. Maybe a little bit, it's kind of there, but the presence of the taste kind of transforms the experience. So, so you might think that taste, uh, unimodal taste and retronasal olfaction are in some senses super additive, that the, um, the result is greater than the, the sum of the parts, or the, the presence of one kind of transforms the other. So I think this kind of example is just basically a kind of red herring. It doesn't really settle the question of whether retronasal or orthonasal olfaction are two different senses, because we're comparing uh, flavour with, uh, with smell. So how could we compare it? Well, to, to do a proper comparison, we would need to compare the same substance um, detected orthonasally and detected retronasally keeping all the other sensory components constant. So having the easiest way to do that would be having no taste involved. Oh, and this experiment has been done. Um, so first of all, uh, Diaz uh, uh, 
for, for a given intensity of olfactant, so they, they use a water-soluble olfactant, they put tubes up people's nose and in their mouth, they give them a, a puff of the olfactant orthonasally or retronasally. Uh, you don't know which it is. In fact, the way they do it is you get a puff of both at the same time, so you can't feel which one you're getting. Um, so one of them is just air and the other one is the olfactant. Um, and they find for the same intensity of olfactant, the same concentration of the, of the smelly substance, that um, orthonasal olfaction is uh, less sensitive than retronasal olfaction. So when you get the substance at the back of your throat, you're more sensitive to it, uh, you can detect it at lower, uh, you have a lower threshold <coughs> response to it, uh, and also the, the sensation is more intense. It's, it's perceived as a stronger uh, smell when you get it retronasally than when you get it orthonasally. Now you know, that might seem surprising given that, as I've said, we've got the same sensory surface ultimately, those substances are, are arriving at the same place and being detected in, in the same way. So one explanation here might be that there's something about the, the, the pathway, the method of delivery, when, when the substance goes up the back of the throat, perhaps more of it just gets to the olfactory epithelium than when it goes through the nose. Somehow it, it gets dispersed or it gets absorbed or something like that. So perhaps there's something about the pathway um, that explains this, this difference. So in a, in a very nice experiment, um, Heilman and Hummel in 2004 controlled for that difference. And the way they did it was, remember I said that there are, uh, in the Diaz experiment there are two tubes going into the nose. Heilman and Hummel have a third tube which goes into the nasal cavity and actually samples the concentration of olfactant in the nasal cavity. So this way they're able to control for uh, differing amounts of substance getting to the, the epithelium. And strikingly, what they found was, even when you control for the concentration, concentration in the nasal cavity, you still get a more intense sensation with retronasal olfaction than you do with orthonasal uh, olfaction. Right? So for the same concentration, you get um, a greater intensity and a lower threshold retronasally than orthonasally. So I think that's a very surprising uh, result. And as I said before, no one really quite knows why that is or what the mechanism is, but clearly there's, there's, some, there's some difference in uh, possibly the direction of airflow, perhaps the epithelium can sense which way the, olfact uh, the olfactant is, is uh, going across the sensory surface. Perhaps it's something to do with the, the pattern of stimulation, perhaps it's the back of the epithelium stimulated before the front, then it somehow picks up on this difference and that, that boosts, the, um, uh, boosts the signal out of the um, well, whatever the mechanism, there, there is a, a difference in the intensity of the uh, experience. So that's one, you might think that's kind of phenomenal difference, right? It's a detectable difference in the, in the phenomenal character. Um, a second difference that we find is that the location of, of the, um, or the, the place where the, the smell seems to be will vary depending on whether it's orthonasal or retronasal. So with orthonasal olfaction, typically it's perceived in, as being in the nose or outside the body. With retronasal, it tends to be referred to the, the mouth or the throat. And by varying a, a series of factors, you can actually change where uh, the back of the throat appears to be. So um, again, the precise mechanism isn't really known, but there seems to be a, co a combination of factors which affect this. So for example, for food, uh, uh, for food odours, they tend to be perceived as being more in the mouth than in the nose. So presumably that's a, a learned response. Um, if you bring taste into the picture, uh, whether the taste is congruent with the smell will affect it. So if you've got a congruent taste and smell, they're more likely to be perceived as a flavour in the mouth. If they're incongruent, so once a food, uh, taste of food and then an odour of something that's not food, it's more likely to be perceived separately. So you don't get this gustatory referral effect that I was talking about. And similarly, the timing of the taste and the smell, if you play with that, if one comes too much before the other or too much after it, they won't really fuse into a flavour perception. They'll, they'll be two separate things. So there's a whole host of factors here which seem to um, contribute to whether you get the, the gustatory referral effect. But the upshot of that is um, there are really only, or at least at the moment, there is only evidence that there are two kinds of differences between orthonasal and retronasal olfaction. Uh, the intensity of the, the sensation and the location where the olfactant is perceived to be. So what does this really tell us about the, the two senses of smell? Well, 
there just doesn't seem to be evidence of, of, the, of the kind that Rosen is appealing to. Remember, he said um, it's very likely that the olfactory component of flavor differs markedly from the olfactory consequences of the same substance in the external world. Well, it doesn't really. All you get is a difference in location and intensity. Um, so that isn't the sort of dramatic results that would suggest that we've got two different senses. What we've got is a, a slight variation, possibly in one sense. Even if, uh, and what I want to say as well is, even if we were to find a substance like this, where it seems to be um, phenomenally different orthonasally and retronasally, we'd need to rule out a number of possible confounds. So first of all, because there is a difference in intensity, um, it's already known that some substances at a very low intensity will, will smell quite differently to the same substance at a higher intensity. So some substances can smell um, uh, quite pleasant in low intensities, quite unpleasant in higher intensities. And then some again, even at higher intensities, maybe they smell pleasant again. So there's lots of complicated chemistry going on. So you need to rule that kind of effect out, given that there's already a difference in intensity between orthonasal and retronasal olfaction. A second kind of confound um, might be due to the kinds of chemical or physical effects that you get through the different delivery pathways. So remember the sort of thing that Harman and Hummel are controlling for. So it could be that there's some chemical reactions going on when you deliver a substance through the throat. Maybe it reaches a different temperature. If it's a volatile compound, it's going to react differently to where it's presented directly to the nose. So again, even if we were to find a case where there is a sort of phenomenal difference that Rosen predicted, uh, we'd have to rule out these, these kind of other explanations in order to say, look, we've really got a difference in phenomenal character. So I would say that the verdict on the phenomenal, char phenomenal character criterion is there, there isn't really a smoking gun here. There isn't really grounds to say, look, we've just got two different types of, of senses. However, that really depends on how you interpret the phenomenal character criterion. If you think the criterion tells you, no, they really have to smell different, they have to be like you know, apples and oranges or something like that, then it looks like we should say they're the same sense. But on the other hand, it's not, it's not like we've got no difference in phenomenal character. We've got a difference in intensity and location. So maybe that's enough to say we've got two different, uh, two different type senses here. Um, so this is really going to depend on our exact interpretation of the criterion. What exactly is the test to say whether there's one or two senses? And this turns out to be a problem for all of the criteria. How do we how do we make these criteria precise? They don't really give us a test that will, will give us a, a definite answer to whether we have one or two senses, unless we, we specify with much greater precision what's being tested. And equally, each of the criteria here is giving us a different answer. Some are saying it's, it's the same, some are saying it's different. So which combination of criteria, criteria do, we, do we use? Um, and what we say for the sense of smell, of course, should apply to all of the senses. So we want to have a single set of criteria which apply across the board to tell us whether you know, the vestibular sense is, is different to the sense of vision or a different sense of proprioception and, and so on. And to give a principled answer, we want to do that in a kind of non-arbitrary way. We don't want to just pick the version that gives us what we think is the right answer. We want to have some kind of grounds for saying, no, this is, this is what makes um, these senses of different natural kinds, um, if we think that's the right way to go. So, so I'd say that the evidence here is kind of equivocal. It just, it just isn't a clear verdict um, as to whether we have one or two type senses. So let's say we're not convinced by that uh, evidence, and we think, well, it looks like they're the same type of sense. There's a second approach we could take, which is saying we have two different tokens of that sense. And to try and um, explain what we might mean by that, imagine this kind of science fictional example. So imagine we encounter an alien with two sets of eyes, right? two pairs of eyes arranged pairwise. So we have two eyes on the top, two eyes on the bottom. And these pairs can function independently. So if we ask the creature, um, they'll say, well, I get you know, this kind of visual sense here, and I get this other visual sense which is, is not connected to that. So I have two fields of vision, one of them corresponding to my, my top eyes and one corresponding to my bottom set of eyes, so let's call them vision one and vision two. So that might be an example where we have a creature that has two token senses of, of vision. 
So I'm kind of intrigued actually. I'm going to ask ask you what what do you think of this scenario? Would would you say this creature has one set uh, one um, token sense or, or two token sets? Or why would you think that? I guess they sort of work together, right? They don't sort of you know it doesn't find itself pulled in two directions at once. Yeah. So I suppose in terms of action, they are. Uh, seems like a fish to me. That's right. Right. Good. Right. Yeah. 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 What, what do other people think? Anyone thinks? I mean, this wouldn't be different from the left eye and the right eye. Good, yeah. So, so that's, that would be a, a comparison case. Why think of you know, our left eye and our right eye as being the same thing? So imagine a creature that has two eyes that are widely separated or pointing in different directions, such that their visual field <coughs> in each eye doesn't overlap, let's say. I've got a picture of a hammerhead shark here. You might think that's such a creature, but in fact, hammerheads have really good stereo vision. They just have a large blind spot in front of their face that little fish can swim up to and, and be quite safe because they can't see it. Um, but you might think a creature like this that has eyes on the side of its head that don't, uh, don't produce a single phenomenal field, you might think that actually has two token sets of vision. It has left vision and right vision, something like that. Um, so the question is going to be, well, how do we, how do we differentiate between these scenarios? Well, on what grounds would we say we have a single token sense as opposed to two? Well, that's touch and right touch. Yeah. Right, yeah. Yeah. Um, why not? Obvious. <laughs> 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 okay, so, well, let's think about what criteria we would use to individuate these, these token senses. Well, one might be, as I've already suggested, if you have two discrete sensory fields, so if it seems to the creature that they've, they've just got these disjoint regions, that don't kind of conjoin or, or interact, that might suggest there are two token senses rather than <coughs> one. Um, in the case of vision, we, um, you know, both of our eyes kind of work together to produce a single visual field, so we, that inclines us to think it's a single token sense. Similarly, we might think the presence of a kind of a step boundary between the two, um, the two token senses. If, if one's different in kind or it has a different kind of percept, um, that rather than a kind of continuous variation of, of percepts between the two. So if, if um, this is actually Grice's example um, of the, the, the four-eyed alien, if, if the alien was to say, well, you know, vision one and vision two, they just, they're just completely different. They seem completely different to me, phenomenally. They're different. That might lead us to think there are two token senses rather than... Uh, in fact, that might lead us to think there are two different type senses, in fact. Um, but if there isn't a kind of smooth gradation between the two, um, uh, we might think there are independent token senses. A third criterion here is a kind of counterfactual criterion. If we were to knock out one of the senses, would it affect the other one? So if we were to, say, knock out vision in your right eye, but you've still got vision in your left eye, that's going to... Um, it's going to affect the qualitative character of your, of your experience. It's going to degrade your ability to perceive uh, depth relationships. So that might suggest they're actually part of the same sense because they're working together. Whereas if you were to knock out one token sense and it doesn't affect the other one at all, that might be grounds to think they're um, independent token senses. Um, and along similar lines... It's funny with the hands, right? right. Yes. So what, what well, what presumably if yeah. you lose a hand, then your sense of touch is still yeah. the same. It can still touch all the same things. Yeah, okay, so that would, that would suggest the hands case. So, so that seems to be the wrong result. So, so maybe this... Or not. We could be wrong about hands, right? Yeah. Hands. yeah. But there's so, no sort of smooth variation between one and the other either. So yeah. So. yeah. I mean, you can run this with all kinds of, you know, sort of sensation on the front and sensation on the back. Or something. Mm -hmm. Are there yeah. different yeah. touch sensors? Um, and the fourth criterion here um, might be if, you, if one modality is, uh, you, is impaired or if you lose it, then you're not able to make a certain type of distinction or it prevents you from performing some kind of function. So this would, be, which would work out differently in the case of hands because, or, or eyes, because if you lose one, you can still, okay, there might be certain discriminations you can't make. You know, I can't see things over there if my right eye's not working. But the type of um, discrimination or the type of function that we can carry out would, would be the same. I can use my other eye to compensate for the loss. So that might suggest that the same token sets. And again, these are not supposed to be Exhaustive, there might be other criteria. I'm just trying to illustrate the kind of grounds that we might, we might use. So again, how does that play out in the case? How am I doing for time, by the way? Yeah, 
So we'll ten more minutes before we okay, finish the question. So, uh -huh. it's up to you. so how does that work in the case of orthonasal and retronasal olfaction? Um, well, unfortunately, the evidence is just is giving me un quite unclear on one of these criteria. So, in the first criteria, um, it's easy if I go back to the previous slide. Do we have discrete sensory fields or regions or a single one? Well, it's very hard to it's very hard to say. Um, are orthonasal and retronasal olfaction in the same kind of sensory field? Or are they different? Well, it seems plausible they're kind of the same. Um, until we think about the interaction with, with taste, um, because as soon as we've got flavour on the picture, then um, it, it's, again, it's, it's hard to say whether taste and smell form a single unified field. I, I think my intuition would say that, that they don't. Um, but if we think that orthonasal and retronasal olfaction have a single sensory field and flavour has a separate sensory field, then it looks like um, that's in, in tension with the idea that retronasal olfaction is somehow contributing to smell. So we, we seem to create a bit of a problem with that one. Similarly to the second criterion, um, is there smooth gradation? Well, I think this one's perhaps more plausible. There is a kind of smooth gradation when we think about the levels of gustatory referral we get. Um, there is a kind of, it seems to be there's this kind of smooth progression that you can, you can get referral um, more towards the front and more towards the back of the throat. I think actually the experimental data doesn't really settle that question. You'd have to do more experiments to see if there are distinct kind of inflection points where there's something that, um, you know, it's, it, um, it's definitely in the mouth or it's definitely in the nose or whether you can really get all the points in between. But that seems like something which we could, we could find out empirically. Um, the counterfactual criterion, um, if you knock out one without the other, what would happen? Um, there really isn't any evidence that you can do this, although it seems theoretically um, possible given that different brain areas are involved. So if you had a very specific lesion to um, the, uh, so perhaps the taste or, or retronasal olfaction area of the brain, maybe you could have orthonasal olfaction without retronasal olfaction. Would it change the phenomenal character? Who knows? But that, again, that's something that would be responsive, responsive to empirical evidence. And similarly with the the substitutability point, um, it's, it's very difficult to say what the outcome would be, but in principle, we might be able to get evidence one way or the other. So, it's not very satisfactory really, because we, you know, none of these criteria is giving us a clear answer. Do we have one, one token sense or two token senses? Perhaps there's an answer there. But again, we're running into the same problem of how do we make these criteria precise enough to, to allow us to make an evaluation and to do that in a way that's not just arbitrary or ad hoc. Um, so again, we seem to be running up against the same, the same problem. We, you know, we can pick a version of the criteria which gives us one answer rather than the other, but who's to say that's the right, uh, the right criteria? So by this point, you're probably wondering, um, you know, why do we actually care about whether we've got one sense of smell or two? What actually turns on it? What's the importance of it? Um, so one, one motivation might be, it just seems kind of compelling to us that in the case, in paradigm cases like vision or audition or taste, it seems that, you know, they really are different senses. There's something quite dramatically different about them. And we want to give a philosophical account of what that, what that is. But there, um, there are other uh, reasons for being interested in the question. And there are other sorts of responses one could give. So Fiona McPherson gives uh, an account where she says, instead of just looking at these criteria individually and picking one or picking maybe two, what we should really do is, is combine all the criteria, you know, the four, the four criteria and maybe others as well, and we should think of these as mapping out a space of possible senses that one could have. So the actual senses we have, the actual senses that humans have, would, would correspond to points in this, this multi-dimensional space. And on this view, it's kind of a fine-grained view, um, the two senses of smell would come out as, as slightly different points or slightly different regions in the multidimensional space. So the mistake here is really to be too attached to the notion of the, the sort of Aristotelian touch, smell, taste, that actually those are just examples of a much wider range of possibilities. And we should just be, you know, okay about that. We should just have a fine-grained uh, taxonomy of the senses. Now, one disadvantage of this view is it only really... Um, answers to the type individuation problem. It doesn't really help us with token individuation. So the space is a space of possible sensory types. 
Um, but in the case of SMIL, we might want to say, well, are these, are these uh, um, two different tokens or not? And the first view doesn't really uh, tell us. Another problem is it kind of relies on us already having an idea of what the criteria are. And as we saw, one of the problems with SMIL is making the criteria precise enough. So again, why should we choose one particular version of the phenomenal character criterion rather than another? It's just not clear. So on McPherson's view, you would need to um, either just count those as, as, as other criteria, all different possible versions of the phenomenal character criteria count as dimensions in the multisensory space, and then you're going to have a very big and complex space indeed, or there has to be some way of choosing a particular uh, precise version of each criteria that we plug into the, uh, into the view. So I think, I'm not really against that, but I think it doesn't really solve all the problems. Another possibility here is um, Matt Fulkerson has, has a view that he calls sensory pluralism. So the idea here is that there's no one privileged account of um, what constitutes a sensory modality. Rather, there are just lots of different versions of that notion, and it depends what you're trying to explain. So if you're a scientist trying to explain what's going on in the nervous system, you might use one, one set of criteria. If you're a philosopher talking about the character of the experience, you might use a different set of criteria. And people using different criteria are just talking past one another. There isn't really um, one notion. There are just lots of different ones, each of them relative to a different explanatory goal. So that's a kind of uh, let all the flowers bloom kind of approach. Uh, now again, I'm not, I don't think there's anything wrong with that, but my worry in a sense is that might just obscure um, certain important distinctions in this, in this area. Um, what I want to do is kind of gesture towards a distinction that, that I think is helpful in, in clearing up this, this conceptual uh, problem. Um, a third view, of course, is that there just are no sense modalities, at least not in the, the natural kind sense that, that people have assumed up till now. Really, experience is just multimodal. That experience is this kind of unified thing with all these different things going on. When we talk about sense modalities, we're really just abstracting different properties out of that, that rich multimodal experience. It's not like they're, they're built in uh, at the beginning. And of course, lots of people now talk about multisensory experience or cross-modal correspondences and, and so on. But I think even if you subscribe to that view, um, even just signing up to the term multisensory kind of commits you to the idea that there are multiple senses which are somehow being integrated or, or unified in this experience. So I think this is a problem for multisensory views. I think the problem is we sort of assume that there is this antecedent notion of a sense, what, what a sense actually is, uh, and people are arguing about, well, which one is the right account? Um, and the problem might be there just is no right account. Um, so just before I finish, um, the distinction that I want to point out is one that's actually present in J.J. Gibson's uh, ecological view of perception. And I think while it doesn't really solve the problem, I think it does help um, to, uh, to make sense of, of some of the disagreements in this area. So Gibson distinguishes between, he actually calls them sensory modalities and perceptual modalities, but I think in a way that, that terminology is a bit unhelpful because what he means by sensory modalities is different to what philosophers uh, normally think of that term. So I'm going to call them sensory information channels. So a sensory information channel is a, a physiological notion. It's a mechanism for extracting certain kinds of information from the environment. So uh, a visual information channel extracts certain kind of information from, uh, from light or information carried by light perhaps. Um, an auditory information channel uh, extracts information from sounds and so on. So this notion is um, a subpersonal notion. We're not talking about a kind of experience or phenomenal character. We're talking about what's the proximal stimuli, what are the causal mechanisms, and what sensory organs are involved. And that's a question that seems responsive to the scientific evidence, right? Scientists can argue about what constitutes a sensory information channel. They might have different uh, competing accounts of of what that is, but it's very much a physiological notion. <coughs> Contrast that with what Gibson calls a perceptual modality, uh, which is a perceptual system that enables the subject to perform certain kinds of tasks or discriminations. Right? So this is a, an experiential notion um, that relates to the phenomenal character uh, criterion. Whoops. Go back stage. So the first sensory information channels really relates to the first two individuation criteria, 
talked about in relation to type senses. The second notion relates to the, the phenomenal character criteria and the representational criteria. What the experience is like. Whoops, it's done it again. Um, so the perceptual, the perceptual um, modality is about a type of experience, but it's a functional notion. It's about what that experience allows us to, to do, how it allows us to cope in the world, what kinds of tasks and discriminations can we, can we make. So the suggestion is really that these two notions aren't really competing notions of a, of a sense modality. Um, it's not like you should choose one or the other, but actually they're, they're both required to give an explanation of what's going on in the, uh, in the case of multisensory integration or in the case of smell. So here would be a sort of example taxonomy of what um, the, the chemical senses, uh, what's going on in the chemical senses. So we have three two or possibly three sensory information channels. So we have gustation coming from the tongue, we have retronasal olfaction, and we have orthonasal olfaction. Um, so if we're just thinking physiologically, then we've got these, these three things here. And we can argue about whether these are really one thing or two things, uh, depending on what the relevant facts are. But that's a scientific <coughs> matter for, um, for neuroscientists and psychologists to, to argue about. Um, what happens in the case of flavor is uh, the gustatory information channel and retronasal olfaction uh, are integrated into flavor. But flavor is a perceptual modality. It's a different kind of thing to, to these. Um, similarly, orthonasal olfaction, that information channel, feeds through to, to smell. So these are the perceptual modalities. Um, flavor, or what we normally call taste, uh, which is a combination of information from uh, retronasal olfaction and gustation, and orthonasal olfaction just feeds into smell. Of course, this is incomplete because we now know that flavor is also influenced by auditory information, visual information, somatosensory information. So it's, it's really a, a, a very rich um, perceptual modality. But the idea is that the, the perceptual modality uh, combines information from all these different sources and it allows us to do things like know whether what we're eating is nutritious or to identify different kinds of substances in the mouth. That's quite a different function to smell. Um, which might also be to do with identifying different kinds of substances, but it doesn't draw on gustation in the same way. So the suggestion is really making this distinction, this kind of two-level account, helps us clear up some of the conceptual uh, difficulties. And it helps us make sense of what we mean when we talk about multisensory experience or integration, uh, where that's integration of different information channels into a perceptual modality. So it doesn't really solve the problem because we've still got this original question of do we have one or two uh, senses of smell? Well, it depends what you mean by a sense. If you're talking about information channels, maybe, we, maybe, maybe they're separate or maybe they're the same. If you're talking about perceptual modalities, um, it looks like there's only one of them. Um, and that should be contrasted with flavor. So that's my kind of speculative suggestion. So just to wrap up then, so I think Rosen's claim that olfaction is a dual modality uh, is at the very least ambiguous, and it's not at all clear cut. And it's not clear what we should uh, say in response to that. I think an important lesson from this is that we can't just read off the empirical data, we can't read off the scientific data, um, what the boundary between the senses are. It's just not going to tell us. We're going to have to define some kind of criteria um, by which we individuate the senses. And the question is then, be how do we select the criteria? It's just not obvious from the, the scientific uh, results. And I think it shows that uh, the traditional criteria that people have used are, are not precise enough to really do this job. We at least have to be much more precise. And to some extent, it's going to be arbitrary which um, precisification we, we choose. And my suggestion was that Gibson's distinction between what I'm calling a central channel and perceptual modality can help us make sense of this notion and the notions of cross-modality and multi-modality. <laughs> Thanks very much.